we're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Partnerships and Community Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am beyond excited to welcome our next guest onto the show, Lori Lizaraga. She is the Murrow and Emmy Award-winning international reporter. Lori, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns, and jumping way back to when you were younger, how did you answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, Christina, thank you so much for reaching out and wanting to do this interview. I am just as pleased and honored to be here as you are to have me. So thank you so much. I appreciate the whole subject matter that you're taking on. It's a big conversation. It's happening in lots of places in lots of different ways. And the best thing that we can do to tackle such a big subject is just to keep talking about it. So I appreciate getting to be here and to do that with you. Um, I am she and hers as well. Lori Lizaraga, you said it perfectly. Um, it's a, it's a hard one. There's lots of consonants. So there I've gotten many <laughs> versions of that pronunciation. Um, I have lots of new job titles now. So it's an interesting season of getting to introduce myself as more than just a television reporter or journalist, um, but also a speaker, panelist, contributor, writer, um, moderator, host. It's been an exciting time to get to embody lots of different roles that I didn't really know my career would uh, allow me to do, especially so early on, I'm, you know, four and a half years into my um my career as a journalist and in this industry. So I, I'm, I'm really blessed. And I know that it's been um, a really special time for me to get to uh, take on all those new roles. Um, what did I want to be when I grew up? That question, we get that question. I think that I was one of those folks who was getting that question and still didn't know totally how to answer it um, all the way up into my junior year of college. So I had lots of ideas about what I thought I wanted to do. I think at my kindergarten graduation, I um, couldn't say my R's. And I said, I want to be a pastor. <laughs> my dad's a pastor. <laughs> my grandpa's a pastor. Um, so I wanted to follow in the family business, I guess you could say. Uh, at a certain point, I wanted to own a restaurant. Several times I said I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I think I've wanted to do just about everything. I think there's like a little Disney Channel star um, dream <laughs> in many of us that I think I thought at one point I might pursue. But to be honest with you, Christina, I think um, the beauty of having found what I found in journalism, my passion, um, when I did is that it's a, it's a really good reminder of you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to conceptualize that there is a job for everything. There is a job to do just about anything that you can think of. It's just a matter of being exposed to what's out there and what you might be good at. And I stumbled upon journalism just like that. The second that I saw it and the second that I realized that somebody has to do that job, sit on the anchor desk, go out and tell stories, take a camera, say what's happening in a community. Um, I fell in love with it, but it really wasn't until I fell into it, saw it at my school, saw students putting on a newscast. And I was like in Narnia, like, where is this? What is this? I didn't even think about the news people having to go to school to get a you know yeah. degree to do that job. Uh, but once I knew about it, I added a third major. <laughs> That's how lost I was. Uh, and I haven't used the other two. Um, but I did graduate with three majors, one of those being broadcast journalism. And I've put it to work for the last five years and have um, only just fallen more in love with journalism and the power that it has. Absolutely. So much power, the power of storytelling. And I will also admit slash relate to, I did practice doing the Mickey Mouse uh, wand thing as a Disney star. So I also shared uh, that. Okay. See, we all, many of us, at least I won't say we all, but many of us have this little spark of, of a dream. Yeah. Again, you, all, you don't know what you don't know, but we exactly. do see 
you know, our peers on TV. So it's easy to want to do that because they look like they're having a ball. Exactly. They look like they're having fun. They are connecting with, with people, especially young people as well. If you fast forward to today, um, you talked a little bit about kind of your personal journey to, to this work and your passion for it. How do you think it has really led you up until this point to your career to be kind of panelist, moderator, speaker, writer, and all of these things in addition to uh, being a journalist? I loved this question, Christina. Um, how do I feel like my personal journey has led me to this point in my career? I don't know that I've ever, I've gotten this question many, many times, right? But I don't know that I've ever gotten it worded quite like that. And I really appreciated this because I think for me and for many people, women of color, many women like me, um, I think the personal journey is sort of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would be nearly as good a journalist and I don't know that I would find it as powerful or as meaningful or feel as passionately about it. Um, if I wasn't from the background that I'm from and if I didn't have the personal journey that I've had, um, the personal journey sort of is the whole thing. I mean, where I was born, who I was born to, immigrant parents, family from Mexico, moms from Ecuador, um, grew up in a Spanish speaking home, an immigrant home, um, watched several family members, including my mom and grandma get their citizenship while I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, struggled to be first generation American, struggled to watch my parents put themselves through school while also raising a family. Um, and then, you know, to have all of my siblings grow up in lots of different situations that some of which afforded us more comfortable living situations and some of which, you know, had us struggling at times while my parents were my age raising five kids. Um, all of that, I, I really have seen so much being a first generation Latina from an immigrant home, a Spanish speaking home. Um, and, and so much of where I'm at in my career is a result of my proximity to, to that community and where I've come from and, and my closeness to um, what so many other Latino families go through, um, establishing themselves in this country and making a better way for themselves and for their families. That proximity to my community, I think, makes me want to stay in journalism and be a journalist. So I, I really think it's the it's the whole thing. I love that answer. I think it is the whole whole journey as well. I mean, we don't check our identity at the door when we go into work or when we show up in these spaces as well. And I think you know the representation we have, you know, the family bonds that we have as well. It really impacts kind of how we how we think about things as well in our world perspective. I want to ask uh, specifically for journalism and again the power of telling the stories. What unique role does journalism as an industry have in developing actual deep-rooted equity strategies instead of just perhaps other performative action that other organizations are taking on? Yeah, we're all after this DEI mission right now, right? Christina, this diversity, equity, inclusion, everybody's doing it. It's not a new thing necessarily, but certainly 2020 and the year of social justice um, surrounding George Floyd's murder has really spawned a new level of energy in companies trying to deliver on this message of representation or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, it's unique for journalism and for newsrooms and news organizations across the country right now, because when we say representation, it's difficult if your newscast doesn't show it. So there are sort of checks and balances along the way of a promise and then proving it. And you can prove it in a lot of really visual, really public ways like hiring diverse people to sit on your anchor desk or go into the reporting field and work for you. You can also you know, publicize that you've hired people of color to sit in management positions or to be producers who stack the show and who choose which stories and which wording we use to tell those stories. Um, but when you say representation in a newsroom, what it also equals is representative stories, representative um, storytelling, representative work that works for communities um, that are diverse, that are um, poor, that are uh, second English as a second language, that are not your traditional stories that generally get talked about in the news for anything other than crime. Um, and so we have several checks and balances, I think, in the newsroom because you can't just put someone of color on the anchor desk and sort of wipe your hands of it. Um, when you say we're being representative, it also has to reflect in a newscast. And the only way that you can really do that is 
to have representative staff who knows where to look, what questions to ask, who to talk to, um, what would concern those communities of color, those diverse spaces, what do they care about, what's happening in their world, and why do we need to talk about it? It would be so difficult, Christina, to be plagued with knowing everything there is to know about every single community. I don't want to be tasked with that role. Right. I am not tasked with that role. And thankfully, if you have a lot of different diverse people in the room, you aren't. You really are just allowed to be an expert in your domain. And I think representation really reveals itself when what you're not asking are questions about specific communities because that community doesn't have a voice in the room. Absolutely. I think it's definitely about having a voice in the room. And like you said, as well, it's about representation, but also thinking about the stories you're telling, the questions you're asking, um, and all the different aspects of, of the organization as well, those checks and balances. When you're talking about representation, I think that's um, a lot of the ways that organizations say are looking at their pipeline. They really want to hire BIPOC folks, people of color, women, which is great, but there is a difference between just having the representation, even in management too, um, an empowered representation. Can you tell us what the difference is uh, between those two? Yeah, on this journey, Christina, with figuring out what is it that I wanted to say with, with this platform and in this season of, of getting to have these sometimes tough conversations because it's difficult to articulate exactly what we mean when we say we want to be included, but it's not enough just to have us in the room. Sometimes that's sort of like a double negative almost like we're it's difficult to articulate such a big subject but I mean the systems that we are um built on haven't necessarily been built by us and certainly not for us and so when we enter spaces and we don't feel comfortable or we don't feel that there's room for longevity there we don't have tenure in these spaces and we don't have shared experience with anyone around us it's difficult to stay um, and, and so we have to think about the culture of the places that we're going into. Yes, there is an effort to include us, but it's not enough to be included so much as it is to change the basis for what the culture is like at a company that makes us feel more included and therefore empowered. And so in thinking about this subject, I think we hear a lot about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and I've sort of come to this new mantra of DEE, diversity, equity, and empowerment, because to be included is just to sort of look around and see someone else who looks like you. But if there are 50 people who look like you and we're all afraid to speak up and we're all sort of taking marching orders to the tune of the way things have always been done and we're doing stories that are familiar or comfortable with our newsroom and with our managers and with our audience, then what we haven't done is go far enough just to be included, but to be empowered, you can have lots of faces that look just like yours. And if none of them is speaking up, then you're just included and that's not enough. We really have to be in spaces where our voices are sought out. And then we feel like when we bring our diversity to the table, it's not going to slow our progress. I think that we're told in some of these spaces, come bring your diversity, bring your shared experience, bring your lived experience, bring your personal experience, bring your community. And then we do, and sometimes we find that somehow it holds us back mm -hmm. when what we felt was invited to come into these spaces and be ourselves. Ourselves in many of these professional workspaces in America is different than our counterparts. Mm -hmm. And different doesn't always friends make and different doesn't always promotions get. Yeah. So when, when a manager or when a newsroom is talking about being diverse and equitable and inclusive, I think the empower part is a good place to, to change out from inclusion to empowerment because I think it forces managers to take some responsibility for what that culture shift looks like. And I think what that means is when the goal is diversity, equity, and empowerment, then you seek out our voices, not just our faces, not just putting us in the room and look, see, they're here, they're included. But empowerment sort of puts a call to action on the people in positions of power. Don't just have her here. Ask her what she thinks. Pursue a personal story. Let her pursue a version of this story that we might not pursue, but she knows to. Um, take an interest in what she thinks about this conversation. Mm -hmm. Encourage this voice, this diverse voice with a diverse background who we hire to be diverse. 
encourage that voice, empower that voice to come forward and be part of the conversation in meaningful ways. Not just enough that we can speak the words out into the room, but that they really matter, that they mean something, that they're considered, thought about, put in a notebook along with lots of other valuable thoughts and contributions, and then something is done with those contributions. Um, we're not looking to have our voices heard so we can simply complain or make suggestions that never get taken. You also then really have to, when you empower a voice to speak up, act on those suggestions and really consider that there might be ways to improve based on what that empowered voice is sharing with you. I think when you change that word out to empowered, it really does make a big difference about what the responsibility is of the people of color in the room, but also of those managers who have allowed them to come there with the promise that their diverse voice will be valuable. Absolutely. I think it's about zooming out and looking at the big picture as well is in asking ourselves the internal work self-awareness questions as managers, as leaders, as executives, is the workplace that I have today set up to empower diverse voices, underrepresented folks in the community? How are we kind of activating those voices? How are we telling those stories and making this environment encouraging? Because if you are, you know, having a workforce that is 50% people of color, but they are staying for 30 days, they're staying for three months, it doesn't make a difference. It's not, you know, a long standing sustainable change as well. Um, and it doesn't meet any kind of goals of the, the organization either. Um, I do want to ask around this changing dynamic of physical being in space, um, full time and hybrid remote first, in terms of community building and creating that meaningful connection with the folks, you know, that you work with. What do you think are key ingredients to be proactive in community building when we are when technology is such a huge part of it? And we also want to make sure that we're mitigating bias, like FaceTime bias as well. Yeah, that's such a good question. And it's a tough one because it's something that I think we're all sort of working on, right, is how to be good at this tech world that we're living in. And some of the some of the great things that it's afforded us to be able to do in this time to continue to see each other, continue to produce really good work, but to be in safe spaces, um, that has been incredible. But it, it is different than being in the room with each other and having organic conversations that happen just because you're simply passing one another. I would say it, communication has to be intentional no matter if you're in the room with each other or if you're remote. And I think that that's, that's the key to building relationships and building community is communication. I think intentioning to have conversations with your employees, if you're a manager, with your colleagues, if you're you know, working anywhere that's a remote situation, um, outside of just having meetings with people because they're in trouble or because it's sort of like the daily meeting, that's not really the communication that I mean. I mean sort of these intentional conversations where you seek out how people are doing, um, how things are going, how their workflow is, how they're feeling, if they're feeling connected, and how you might be able to help better connect them with someone who, after talking, you feel like they would get along with. Um, we really do have to be, I think, more intentional with the communications that we send, because often I know um, it's been my work experience before that the only times I really got FaceTime with bosses was when I was getting in trouble for something or having to be discussed, you know, something serious and nerve wracking. Right. If the only times we associate having conversation is when we're doing a yearly review or we're, you know, having to improve on some level of our work, um, you know, it makes it difficult to be able to have real conversations and really build relationship. And especially when it comes to um, creating diverse workspaces that retain diverse talent. It's really the responsibility of the workspace to ensure that we are successful there. And the only way that you can see our progress, how we're fitting in, how we're doing, how equipped we feel at our job, how much more training we might need, um, how much more of a challenge we might need to keep us in the room. Mm -hmm. The only real way to gauge our level of feeling good in our new space of working remote or just working anywhere in general period is is to check in and to ask those tough questions about how your folks are doing. I 
I deem it the responsibility of workplaces across the country right now who are promising to create more diverse and more inclusive and representative workspaces. Along with that promise needs to come the longevity of those diverse hires that you're making. And our tenure really, really matters. It's not just a question of how many people of color does any organization have in the room. It's really about how long are those people of color staying because you can fill a quota, um, but have you really changed a culture if you can't retain your diverse hires? And that's really a reflection of, of the workspace. And so if, if the workspace wants to be truly representative and diverse, um, it's the workspace's responsibility to invest in its diverse talent so that we do succeed. Absolutely. What resources are available? How are you investing in upskilling? How are you investing in professional development, career pathing, um, and that internal mobility is, is really important for the growth of an individual as well. And retention, as you were saying, is not just about hitting a, a quota or hitting your numbers. Um, it's about that long, sustainable change that you're looking for at the organization and really empowering voices uh, as well. And you mentioned intentional communication, something that uh, we definitely believe in and I believe in personally as an individual as well. And part of that is active listening. Another part of that is the language that you use and being really intentional um, and inclusive as well. So while at Nine News, uh, some folks might be familiar with uh, an article around uh, verbiage used in the kind of newsroom. So leaders were asking you to use the language to describe someone um, who is here uh, in the country as here illegally or illegally in this country. And you ask them to kind of change their verbiage around this um, to describe folks as undocumented. Can you contextualize why this difference is in language is so important? Of course, I mean, we've been talking about citizenship and the path to citizenship and what that looks like for immigrants in this country ever since the country was founded. It's concerned lots of different communities at lots of different times. Um, for the most recent history up to now, it has deeply involved uh, Mexican immigrants. My family is from Mexico. Um, and as I said, I, I've watched several of my family members um, on their journey to citizenship as well after having moved to the States from Mexico or from South America. Um, it's difficult because everyone's situation is extremely unique and it's a very complicated subject, just the nature of us trying to have this question answer portion is challenging because the language is difficult and it matters and the path to citizenship and all of the nuances on your way to that path, whatever that looks like for you are very unique and very complicated. Um, you know, immigration law is extremely confusing. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that language is extremely powerful in how we use it to describe or inform our public about a certain group of people is very influential, especially when you're talking to people who in many, many cases may not have a personal relationship with anyone who has gone through a journey to citizenship, um, who may not have close relationships with or working proximity to families who are immigrant families mm -hmm. and who don't have their citizenship in this country. And so um, if you don't have really any proximity to this subject, it's all the more foreign. And what we say when we introduce you to any level of closeness to the subject uh, could be the only thing that you have to go on when you think about immigrants, immigrant families, and, and the choice to not pursue your citizenship, um, which is very much not usually a choice, but, mm -hmm. you know, I'll digress. It's a complicated subject. The point yeah. being that when I brought up these conversations, it's because I know that I wouldn't want my family members, my mom, my grandmother or any of the other family who, and very, very close friends whose journeys I have watched either result in citizenship or not, even though they have tried very hard. Um, the roadblocks to citizenship are many and often and high and large. And 
to simply put words around an entire community that say illegal, that purport a crime about the person mm -hmm. um, is very informative. And many times it's often just wrong. People have work visas, people have green cards. Again, it's a complicated subject. So to simply throw this blanket statement of in the country illegally, it's too complicated of an issue and it's an unfair way to blanket summary an entire community of very complicated people um, because all groups of people are complicated and nothing exists in a vacuum or you know, is exactly the same. So to be fair, um, undocumented or here without paperwork or you know without citizenship all feel like you know some are refugees um there are so many asylum seekers even there are so many different situations so to put in the country illegally on all of those situations would be you know it wouldn't be fair but it also would just be incorrect um and so to be open to language like that and to be open to remembering the power that language has um was a conversation that didn't really go all that well in my newsroom at that time, but very, very happy to report that after the piece came out and it got as much attention as it did, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists got involved and spoke to the sister, or rather the um, parent company of my former newsroom, mm -hmm. um, Tegna. And since those conversations went on and the pressure was on, I'm really happy to say that they did answer the call to change that standard in more than 60 newsrooms across the country, including my former newsroom, Nine News in Denver, to remove the use of the standard in the country illegally when talking about undocumented immigrants, and instead to be able to be open to verbiage like undocumented asylum seekers and, you know, without paperwork or any number of different options, uh, excluding in the country illegally. So I'm really happy because what I know is that it really did deter me and lots of other journalists like me who have a personal relationship with this tough subject uh, and the power and influence of that word. Um, it did deter many of us from telling um, immigrant stories because it didn't feel fair to use that kind of verbiage when talking to such complex communities and people. Um, and so there was a lot of immigrant coverage that never got done and stories that never got told because it just didn't feel fair. Uh, and I'm I'm happy now going forward that there are journalists in more than 60 newsrooms now who won't have to feel that same level of fear or sadness over telling their the stories of immigrant families all over the country. Um, because we'll be, a, be able and be empowered to better use language that is more fair, that is more honest and, and more correct. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to your earlier point as well about the personal journey being the full journey and bringing different perspectives into the workplace, specifically the newsroom and your opportunity to really change the careers and just perspectives of other folks who are telling these really important stories to be I could all be truthful um, and no group is a monolith as well. So it's really important exactly. to highlight that too. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about real diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice. Work is having conversations around topics or things you might not have as close proximity to, but you're working with people who do. And oftentimes I would say in many organizations or systems, we are in PWIs, which are predominantly white spaces uh, or institutions. Um, I want to ask from your perspective, this doesn't have to be a place where you have worked at before or just something that you've seen where, you know, there is being really impactful diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I think there are so many places who are on their way to getting this right, right now. Um, many of which we probably haven't heard of because they haven't made the news for the negative reasons, but yeah. we don't always highlight the, the good things that are happening in a, in a system or in an organization. So I know that there are people, A, who are just making the effort, which is really a, a fantastic start. No one is going to do this 100% right because we're learning. I think we're all learning how to better include everybody in a conversation, everybody in a workspace. Um, and so, yes, it's a work in progress. But I mean, I have been able to 
see even just other newsrooms, other workspaces who have invited me to come speak over the last year, um, who are really trying to turn to their diverse communities and within the newsroom and within the places where the workspace is, the cities, the community leaders, um, to really ask the questions they know they don't know. And I think that's one of the strongest things I've I think I've seen out of any workplace right now in terms of nailing the DEI effort on the head is sort of that first stage of admitting, I don't, I don't know. know. And I think that that's a really, really healthy, great spot to be at um, because it leaves a, an open space for the learning. And I, I do think that it's fair to get defensive. Um, when we purport that our white workspaces aren't working for us. Um, I understand this sort of urge to get defensive over that we're trying, we're hiring here, our number. It's less about an argument so much as it is about being open to the possibility that it isn't a hundred percent right yet. And as soon as we can sort of take off that ego for all of us and remember that it's okay that predominantly white workspaces don't have it totally figured out for all of their communities of color, for all of their new hires, for all of anybody who's been able to be there who is a person of color, for anyone who's from a diverse background of any kind, English as a second language, mm -hmm. um, any sort of background that isn't the mainstream. Um, I think as soon as a workspace can just admit that it wasn't necessarily built by or for diverse communities, then you can really start to make progress. And I've seen a lot of workspaces and a lot of newsrooms, um, especially in public media, um, pursuing the idea that they might not have it right, but they're willing to ask questions and to learn. And I think that's really, really healthy. It's a healthy space to get to that's like, I didn't even know that we were doing that to be able to admit that there has not been enough effort towards this, to be able to throw resources at it, not just seek out your one person of color in the room and then task them with teaching everyone, but really realizing how important this subject is, not just to um, you know, have your one hold a talk or you know, do a once a year diversity, equity, inclusion training, but to really realize that this effort requires a day in day out effort um, that is very intentional and that does require time and resources that does require potentially new hires that does require potentially hiring an outside company to help you get it right and do it better uh, and that really starts with me having seen the companies who are reaching out and saying I had no idea I'm afraid that I might have people of color in my workspace who feel the way you talk about feeling in your article. And I'm really, really open to the possibility that after having read your piece, that is happening where I, where we, where we work and in the, in the newsroom or in the workspace that we have created, is there a chance that you could come and allow us, you know, the, the opportunity to speak with you or what would you suggest? And I mean, I think starting from that ground zero of, we may have room to do this better. That's a really, I think that's a great place to be. I think having that growth mindset is really important and what you said around taking necessarily a personal out of it, the ego as well, and looking at historical, societal, and systemic things that are happening as well um, and really being open to people's experiences too is yeah. something that's really important. Also not putting the pressure on the 5%, 10%, one person of color in the organization, the only woman in the organization as well, uh, bring in folks whose whole body of work this is, subject matter experts, people who are willing to tell their stories um, is also important. And I think having that kind of open-mindedness does relate to feedback that people are uh, going to get positive, negative, mm -hmm. in between. Uh, from your experience, how do you see employee feedback management as a really important tool to build a culture of proactive, trust and listening at really successful organizations too. That feedback is so huge. I mean, if you think about the things that we've complained about in any workspace that we've ever been in, I feel like a lot of times it's because it's been handed down by managers or by executives who have never actually walked the walk of the 
by and large, large vast of sort of like workhorses who are running the company and making things happen. When there's sort of that disconnect between who is calling the shots and then who is having to change their ways as a result of that, you do sort of see that frustration that happens. I wish they could walk a day in our shoes. I wish they understood sort of what we were doing here on the ground floor. Making everything happen comes from us. And yet decisions are made all the time that really don't seem to take into account the day to day. And there are people who are doing the day to day who could very much speak life and speak real progress into making progress. If we were called upon to do so, sometimes we are. And we feel like if we say what we truly honestly feel that it's not going to go very well for us. So there has to be a couple of changes that occur in a culture in order to make your employees feel like they're feedback is wanted uh, and then not just wanted and we can't just have a manager nod at us and say it's good glad you feel like you got this off your chest keep at it because to be heard is one thing we can get a therapist if we really you know just need to be heard and we can talk to our colleagues and our peers and and we can have those conversations in our own time what we want from those conversations is to really have the nod but then also see that that turns into something, that it produces some level of change or that it's contributed to improving things. People don't want to just talk for the sake of hearing themselves talk so much as we'd like to see change as a result of what we've brought forward. And so many times I think we get the nod and and we get it off our chest and then we sort of wait for where's the announcement, where is the change? And that can be really dejecting and discouraging to sharing your feedback the next time because you sort of know better than putting yourself in a position of sharing and it not turning into anything. And then all you are to your manager is somebody who complains. You know, you really have to want that feedback from the people who are on that ground floor, boots on the ground, doing the work. Uh, those are the people who can really tell you where their, their stance to be improvement, money saved, money earned, um, better communication, a better workflow, whatever that looks like. I, I really do think we've all said it, right? If only they came down here, they would see how yeah. ridiculous this version of improvement is. And so I, I think if you, if you, you know, want productive um, improvement, then it, it really should probably come from the feedback of the people who are doing the work. And, and, we'll only feel really open to giving that true, honest feedback if it's a workplace that rewards that, both by listening and then acting on it. Absolutely. Feedback is a gift and it provides insights on how to make the business better, how to make your workplace better, how to retain the talent that you have spent time and, and resources really cultivating and hopefully upskilling. And again, going back to developing careers too and making the workplace a, a great kind of, whether it's remote, in-person or hybrid, uh, organization to to work with as well. Lorga, I know so we spend Christina too. We spend so much time in our work. Um, you know, and and I think we forget sometimes that while we're supposed to keep it professional, we really spend the majority of our week and our time in a nine to five job, whatever that looks like for anyone listening. We know to keep it professional, but what we also know is that so much of our hopes and dreams and goals and aspirations are built around the workspaces that we're in and the titles we're given and the success we're trying to see in those spaces. So it's difficult to disconnect the personal level of that because so much about the pride that you feel, the accomplishment that you feel, the progress that you feel that all really is such a personal thing. And that all really does come from those workspaces. So I think, I think it's important too, when you talk about that feedback element to remember that people want so badly to have a great workplace experience. It's where we spend so much time and where we invest hopefully years and so much energy, effort, concentration. Um, and so to reward that, I do think that it's important to remember that people have a reason to care. The idea is to stay a long time at a company that you love and to create a, a place like that really requires the feedback, the open communication, the conversation from people who, who are very much building their own personal accomplishments 
Um, and in so doing, they're building the accomplishments of the company. So I, I really think while it's supposed to be, you know, this professional relationship that we have with our workspace, it's also important to remember as, you know, the people who are calling the shots and the people who are making the decisions and the positions of power that there are a few people, I think, who work in companies who don't care how it turns out for them there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the stat is that we think so, if not more, a spend of our third of our lives working uh, in our jobs, in a variety of jobs. So we're spending a lot of time working for the mission of the organization, working with the people. Um, and we do, we really want to have a good experience there, make others feel valued and feel valued ourselves. I know I've been asking really specific questions around workplace, reimagining culture um, and your journey, but what is the next story or stories you're excited to tell? I love this question, Christina. I appreciate it so much. I, I'm so excited to be in a time where I, especially, you know, people of color and especially Latinos in the Latino community are really getting, um, are getting their time. We have always been here and we have so many valuable and important things to add to the conversation and to talk about. Um, so many things that concern us, so many things we're working for, so many things we're working to change as community, as individuals, as families. Um, and it's really, it's incredible that there is more of an appetite for that storytelling of diverse communities, of diverse people doing incredible work to rectify wrongs, to rewrite a foundation um, that we were built on that wasn't built for us or by us, to really contribute and not to be exceptional just because we're people of color doing the most basic thing, but because we're people of color doing the most incredible things of anybody that anybody is doing. And it's it's nice to be able to tell those stories without caveats of how special because the person was black or you know, Latino or indigenous or whatever it may be, look at the caveat of they're great and it's nice because somebody of color did it. People of color are in these spaces doing incredible things all the time. And it's so nice that there is finally an appetite to talk about that because we've always been here. We've always been being great. And I think now without the caveat of like, well, here, sure, you know, tell a story about a community of color. It really is more about we're here. We're a ginormous demographic who needs to be spoken to and have news directed at it about it. And it's nice to see that that is finally a priority more and more in lots of different ways and in lots of different spaces. And I'm excited to see that we're not letting our differences, my white colleagues, my black colleagues, my everybody colleagues, I think are letting these differences between us come into play less and less. And we're interested in each other more and more. I think differences can be scary. Unknown is a little nerve wracking. <laughs> The more we know, though, the less nervous we are, and the more we find out that there really aren't that many differences between so many of us. There are things that connect so many communities in so many ways that we don't even realize until we start talking to each other. And I think that's that's what makes me the most excited is that the more that we learn about each other and the more we tell stories about communities like mine, Latino communities, the more we realize Oh, that's that's so great. I had no idea that that's what that was about. I had no idea that that was the intention. I had no idea that that was the history. I had no idea that that was who people like, you know, Lori were. Um, and, and that means a lot to me. That means a lot that we're sort of closing that that gap of knowledge. The more we know, I think the more we're going to realize we really like each other and we really like the differences and the and the cultures and all of the things that everybody brings to the table. It makes it fun. And I think the more you know, the more accessible that is and, and the larger your community becomes. Absolutely. The broader your community comes and also just having those meaningful conversations, taking time not only to ask how someone is, but ask how they really are and listen to the response and have a conversation around that too. Um, and understand people's personal journeys all, all look different as well. Lori, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or one to two kind of key takeaways based on everything that we just talked about that you hope people bring with them? I appreciate this conversation so much. I appreciate the other conversations I've heard you have with so many influential leaders and leaders of color and, and just diverse people who are making a difference in their workspaces. It means a lot to hear that so many of us are on this same mission. Sometimes it feels like you're 
a little isolated on a goal um, by yourself trying to make it all happen. The world is heavy, so we don't want to lift it on our own. And it's nice to know that we're most definitely not doing that. Um, there is a mission here, and I think so many of us are on it. And that that makes me motivated and inspired and really, really proud. Um, what I'll say is for anyone you know who is in a position as a uh, an employee in a workspace where you don't feel that diversity, equity, and empowerment level, um, feel free to have the permission, give yourself permission, take permission from listening to this to um, empower yourself and to really seek the spaces for you if it's having the conversation to hold someone accountable for that lack of empowerment or if it's pursuing another workspace that really is getting the empowerment part of that right. Whatever that looks like for you, I think people of color are really coming to a, a reckoning within ourselves at, at the value that we have and the, um, the invaluable experience that we bring to any space that we're in. And I think the more that we sort of grab that within ourselves and believe in ourselves and stop sort of taking the spoon fed story that we're just lucky to be here, but instead really believing about ourselves that we are irreplaceable and very, very needed in every single workspace, in every single organization, in every single space in this country. Um, I think that you give yourself permission to feel valuable, but you also remember that you truly are incredibly valuable and needed. And there are workspaces out there for you that are going to remind you of that. Um, and so if it's not the one you're in, have the conversation, do your part to build um, change. And if change can't be gotten there, then make sure that you uh, pursue it somewhere else. Because I think people are uh, in the professional workspaces of America working very hard to rewrite um, the foundations of what we've come to expect as people of color. And that's very exciting. I think that there is a lot of opportunity and excitement um, for POC in this 2022 year that's coming. And for every company that's promised DEI, um, we are not far enough away from the social justice movement um, to have forgotten those promises. And so I'll just, and you know, and close by saying that we still are very much expectant for what uh, 2022 will bring because there are still, there is still a really long way to go. And we very much expect companies and, and workplaces across the country to do their part too. Absolutely. Those are great call to actions to kind of end our conversation on. Know your value, be a agent, hold yourself and others accountable. And there are workplaces that will value, will value your efforts because you have, you have something to say and something amazing to contribute. Lori, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture today. I really appreciated this, this interview. I appreciate the conversation so much, Christina. Keep having these conversations. It means a lot to so many people I know, and I just appreciate my chance to talk with you. This is so fantastic. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking forward to keeping in touch and seeing uh, what's next on your on your path. Um, and as a reminder- Me too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in the empowerment of everyone to speak up and know that employee feedback management is, is really important. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.